This is a video which is for beginners to making microprocessor based projects. We have a lot of people looking at our videos and whilst it's obvious that a lot of people have a jolly good idea what they're doing, others would like to build something using a micro and yet they can't start because there are lots of questions to ask. We asked a lot of questions and I've thought, you know, it'd be a good idea if we actually make a video which details exactly how I go about making myself a, a project. And as we've had people asking, saying, oh, we can do something with the 6502. Okay, this one is going to be the 6502, I call it the beginner's guide to making a microprocessor based circuit. And what we'll do is, this obviously this is the A6502, but what we'll ultimately be trying to produce is something looking like this. Now this is the smallest processor board which I have kicking around. Um, and that, as you can see, quite clearly is not a 6502, it's a Z80. But um, I'm simply showing this one because this is this is the smallest board I can find. Um, we're doing it on Vero board. The Vero board has sockets on it and the ICs are in the sockets. People ask what sort of sockets we use. We either use the folded pin ones, which are like these, or we use the turned pin ones, if I can find one over here which you have the turn pins quite honestly there's not a lot to choose between them either price wise or reliability wise i think all these things are pretty reliable these days and i must admit i do tend to use whatever i happen to have in the box but if you're going to use an eprom and keep putting an eprom in and out in and out it's very very difficult to do with these i'd much rather use these because they're much easier to put uh, many pins in at once but unfortunately these things don't like it if you keep inserting in um, you know taking out all the time and they tend to pull the pins out so what I tend to do if I'm going to put it on an EEPROM is I'll put one piggyback socket on another so when I've damaged the top one I can take that off and put another one in its place so that's what I tend to do with those if we look at the quickly look at the bottom of this thing this will show you what we're going to what we'll be doing um, you can see that the wiring is all done up along these wiring combs these are the little black things you can see here now they come in two different sorts um, there's the white coloured ones and they're black coloured ones. The white ones well, used to be made by Vero, I don't know if they still are. They're, I'll show you those a bit closer in a minute. And then the black ones obviously are just like the ones here. Now all the wire is run between the pins along here using a wiring pen. If we lose that for a minute. This is a wiring pen. I've shown it on many more of my um, videos. And what you have is the, the reel of wire in the end and the wire comes out the, the bottom here. As you can see and you can choose different wire gauges to use I mean there's a selection here um, ranging from there's there's sort of like 38 SWG um, fatter ones there's also some that if oh yes sorry that one's a yeah that one's actually tin copper wire as you can see it's not actually insulated these are insulated and what you do is you wind the using the pen you wind it round each IC leg feed it through the combs take it to the next one then you solder it and the solder burns off this um, insulation, this enamel insulation. It's quite nasty stuff actually, releases some really toxic gases. So it's an idea to do it with a bit of ventilation in there. I'd say a lot of ventilation actually being very serious about it. Um, uh, but other than that, there's, there's sort of no issues with that at all. If we go back to our board now, just a couple of points to make about this. You'll notice that what we're doing is we have the, the, the uh, tracks vertically. As you can see on the maps, the tracks are going vertically. And these tracks have to be cut at some points, like between IC legs. Now, you can cut those with a drill bit. It's quite easy just using a, a drill. Um, I personally use the proper barrow cutter. What I'd, I'd call it, strip ball cutter, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's so much easier with the handle on it. Um, so that's what I use for those. The thing is... You have to remember that the layout is of paramount importance. You don't start one of these or start soldering it up until you've had a chance to go through it and work out where all your sockets are. Um, but uh, we'll look at that one in a minute. Now you notice with here, let's point out a few obvious things. There is obviously going to need a reset button. The reset button here is here. So that's your user input. Um, I like to put a display on all of my projects simply because I have a job lot of the things and I bought them and I find them very useful you can tell straight away if everything's working and you can always take it out of the socket and reuse it for something else. Uh, there's a couple of LEDs here as well you'll notice there are decoupling capacitors 
between the ICs, very important to have decoupling capacitors. I usually like to put the power rails down one side and the other side, then take it across to the pins which, which need it. Um, in this particular one, this was a cable tester and it was meant to, it had some mini DIN sockets on the bottom. 6502 single board computer, as we'll call it now. Um, you will actually need the following things on that board. First of all, you need a clock, that's a master oscillator for the CPU itself. Namely, this consists of a crystal and a 7414 or LS14 or HC14. Next, you need a, some form of reset circuitry. We can use three or more gates from the 7414 package from the crystal oscillator. A ROM to store your program, either an EEPROM or an EEPROM with two E's. Uh, as the latter is very easy to program and erase if you don't have access to UV light, etc. Then you need a RAM. This is to temporarily store your programs. Uh, and to use the CPU stack facility, you have to have one of those. Some form of decoder to allow us to use different I.O. and memory devices. A display, so you can actually see the results on the CPU. Obviously, uh, you may just take this out when, it, when you have it working and use it for a, another project. And other ICs, along with all the ones above, uh, which is essentially the glue logic and a divider chip to divide our clock crystal down to what is required by the CPU. Lastly, an I.O. input device with a switch or switches for us to interact with the program. Here is our piece of Vero board which we'll be using for this project. Um, it's, it's of a size uh, with 0.1 inch pitch holes. There are several uh, sizes you can, you can buy pitch wise. You want the 10 to the inch. That's 0.1 of an inch is the pitch of the holes here. This particular one is 100 by 160 millimeters, which is quite a nice size and I find it quite useful. And you can put your processor on there and quite a few bits and pieces. In fact, we've done a six, uh, 68,000 microprocessor was done on one of these boards to show, yes, it can be done. Okay, so, so looking at this, on the other side you have just the, the holes, this side you have the tracks, and these are the bits we were talking about which we use the, the track cutter, which will cut the bits when we actually need to do it, that's what, that's what those for. But what I suggest you do straight away is you use one of these, or look very closely. Why? I have had a couple of these boards in the past, in fact one of the projects we did for the, these YouTube videos actually had a couple of track um, joins where the etch has not etched away all the tracks and you could end up with a, a disastrous project if somewhere underneath all your wiring combs and things there's two bits joined together so it's well worth using an eyeglass or even looking very close on it to check that um, all the tracks are cut um, so so that's that's all I'm suggesting here um, back to the sockets now we have another look at that we have the, the sockets Remember, you work out what sockets you need for the particular project. Now, how do you know how many sockets you use? Fine. Well, what you need is two pieces of paper. Then we say, once again, this is a, for beginners. You can do what you like, but this is how I go about it. This is the first one, and this is actually will be our 6502 single board computer. There is a circuit. I try and make the circuit as simple as possible by ignoring all the data buses and the address buses. That way you can only see what we call the glue logic and the connections to it either side. Uh, this part being the reset circuit, this part being the clock circuit, that's the CPU, the ROM, the RAM, the decoder, and some bits and pieces here. A little pin out for the display which we use. Likewise, the memory addresses we'll be talking about when we actually start programming the thing. And from this we can see it takes one 14 pin, I beg your pardon, three 14 pin sockets, a 16 pin, then obviously we need a 40 pin for this fella and 24 pin because I'm only going to use a 2k ROM and a 2k RAM. Once again, you design your project, you work out how big it is and therefore you work out what sort of sockets you need. The second most equally important piece of paper is this one, which is the netlist. The netlist being the signals, the IC and what is connected to what. This simply means that if you are going to make a run of address zero for example you would see that it goes first of all to pin 9 of the 6502 pin 8 of the 2716 pin 8 of the 2016 ram and pin 5 of the dl1414 that's what the idea of this is and if you if you double check this and triple check it and check everything's right on it then you'll be using this and nothing else when you come to wire up your board